Well, good morning and welcome to Sierra Bible Church. It is such an honor to gather with you in your home together this morning. Uh, As you can see, our Sunday morning ministry team has been working extremely hard to make sure that we can continue to gather digitally together during this time. If you have your Bible in your home, just go ahead and take it. Take it with you on your couch or in your bed or on your living room floor or on your kitchen table, wherever you're watching this live stream. Grab your Bible, open up with me to Joshua chapter 13. We've been working our way as a church through the book of Joshua over the course of the last number of months here. And as we've seen in Joshua, Joshua is a description of a God who fights on behalf of his people, a God who goes before his people and battles for his people to not only give his people victory, but also in the aftermath of victory, give his people an inheritance. One afternoon about 10 to 15 years ago, my grandma and grandpa began passing out checks to their kids and their grandkids, of which I am one of them. Uh, We didn't do anything to deserve these checks, but as they were passing them out, my my grandfather said, God has been so good to us. We, We sold our house, and now we want to distribute the money that we received from the sale to our family. My grandparents bought the house, my grandpa worked on the house, my grandma kept that thing spotless and clean, and then my grandparents together sold the house. They did all of the work for the house, and they even sold the house, but I, as their grandson, received the benefits simply by being one of their heirs. God does the same thing for his children. If we've trusted in Christ, according to John chapter 1, verse 12, we are members of God's family, and God has an eternal inheritance for us, his children. This pattern of God's graciousness towards his children to give them what they do not deserve is, is throughout the entire Bible. From the Old Testament into the New Testament, God desires to be abundantly gracious towards his people. And in today's passage, we're going to see that God is even being extra generous towards his people. But what I think that we're going to find most compelling about today's text and the God who is shining forth in the passage in today's text is that even when God takes away everything else from his people and only gives us himself, he still is far more than anything we could ever need. In today's passage, God gives us a command, he gives us a commitment, and he poses one clear question. But through it all, we're going to see that God's grace towards us is far better than anything we could ever imagine. Now, I want to ask you a question. While you're sitting there in your living room, around the dining table, maybe on your floor, I want to ask you a question. How many of you would consider yourselves perfectionists? Now, because you won't be disturbing anybody else, and because it's going to be a fun thing, go ahead and call out the perfectionist in your family by putting their name in the comments section below. Who is the person that is in your house that just can't handle the socks being on the floor for more than five seconds or the dish being left in the sink unclean for more than five minutes? Go ahead, name that person in the comments section of this particular video and even feel free to tag them. If that's you, don't get mad because God has a word for you. While God's standard for his people is definitely perfection, be perfect as I am perfect, what he is concerned most with in his children, that they are responding to his grace by making progress, by making progress. As we see in verse 1 of chapter 13, Joshua is getting old. 
His life was winding down. He, he knows that he can't continue at the conquering pace that he has gone forth throughout the entire book of Joshua chapters 1 through 12. He, he can't continue to fight the battles that he had been doing in his youth. So God speaks to him very clearly. Joshua, you are old and advanced in years. Thanks, God. Like I didn't know. I appreciate that. Isn't it great when God just simply tells you the blunt truth? Your cholesterol is high, and you need to get more exercise. You are old and advanced in years, and there remains very much land to possess. While Joshua has conquered so much of the promised land, while he's made significant progress for the people of God in advancing the mission of God based on the promises of God, the work of God was yet to be complete. Then God goes ahead and he lists all of the lands that are yet to be conquered in verses 2 through 5. These were the pockets of people in the promised land that had not yet been engaged by the Israelites. They were the regions of the Philistines, the Geshurites, the five rulers of the Philistines from Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, Akron, the rulers of the Avim, the, Sid uh, the Sidonians, the, the Gibelites, and the inhabitants of the hill country. All of these people remained in the promised land at the end of Joshua's life, even though Joshua had made significant progress the people of God had not yet fully finished the task. And God gives a, a clear promise to his people in the midst of this command. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. They are guaranteed that their work was not in vain and that they will continue to make progress. Yeah, they weren't perfect, but they will continue to make progress according to what God had called them to do. The, the next step in their progress is to fully allot the inheritance that God was given to each tribe. In, in the second half of verse 7, or verse 6, excuse me, all the way through verse 7, God commands for Joshua to divide the land along the portions that are, even the portions that are still occupied by the other peoples in the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. This command God was calling his people to uh, do for, uh, that God was going to do for them what they could not do for themselves. God was calling his shot before he even stepped up to the plate. God was saying, in essence, act on my promises now and then make progress towards the finished product that I will perfect in my time. I will complete the task, but you make progress now. On May 25th, 1961, uh, President John F. Kennedy stood before Congress and he said that the U.S. should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning safely to Earth. The message, while ambitious, it wasn't received with immediate enthusiasm. In fact, a Gallup poll at that time stated that 58% of Americans were opposed to it. Yet with courage and strength and resolve, the American people were the first to land astronauts on the moon eight years later in July of 1969. They made continual progress for eight years and eventually achieved their goal. Yet through this entire time period, JFK's promise wasn't guaranteed. The USA, they could have failed in their objective. The Israelites, on, on the other hand, they were guaranteed victory. God was going to drive out the peoples from among them. They could allot their land, distribute the inheritances among the tribes because God declared that it was theirs. They simply needed to make progress towards God's goal. Don't worry about perfection yet, God says. I will complete the task. I will drive them out. You be concerned with making progress. Brothers and sisters, the, the, the promises that we are given in Christ, they are guaranteed. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purposes of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This all things in the passage in Ephesians means all things. Cancer, poverty, sickness, disease, COVID-19, God works 
all things according to the counsel of his will. And according to this passage in Ephesians, all of these all things that are being worked together for the counsel of his will are so that we might obtain our eternal inheritance in Christ. Brothers and sisters, this should make us bold and courageous to make progress in becoming more like Christ. This time where the deadly virus of COVID-19 is spreading across the world, God has ordained this specific time and purposed this specific season in your life so that you, as an individual Christian, might make progress in looking more like Jesus. This is what he wants from you. He wants you to become more like his son in whom you will receive an internal inheritance from. This means you, as a member, as a participator, as a person who is in Christ, you should love your neighbor like Christ has loved you. You should be be generous with your resources towards the work of Christ in this world that is continuing to advance even amidst the season. You should be using your downtime to grow spiritually and to disciple your children. You, You should be using your time in your marriage to have those hard conversations that you've been putting off so long in your marriage so that you and your spouse might look more like Christ when this is through. And you should be involved in the distribution of your resources to the most needy and the most vulnerable among us. You are not in quarantine just to binge Netflix, play video games, and veg. God wants you to make progress. God wants you to make progress not because you need to in order for him to love you more. God wants you to make progress because he's already given you overabundantly more grace than you could ever have needed. And he simply wants you to display that grace by looking more like his son. In verses 8 through 13, Joshua distributes the land to the tribes which he did not conquer. Joshua didn't conquer it, Moses did. Joshua faithfully and obediently, yeah, followed God's command just as Moses did. Uh, But now we see in verses 8 through 13, he's distributing the land that is east of the Jordan, the inheritance of the land that he didn't battle for. In fact, this land, it wasn't even originally a portion of the promised land. It was simply a bonus inheritance as they were passing through it. God gave it to the Israelites, and now Joshua is to distribute it among two two and a half tribes. God is being extra gracious and extra generous to his people by giving them above and beyond what they were expecting. They needed to treat this land as their inheritance, even though they didn't earn it. It was given to them by God himself and distributed among the half-tribe of Manasseh, among Reuben and Gad. Also, I want to take a moment and just pause and just notice how faithful Joshua is being during this time. He's towards the end of his life. He's about to die. And what does he do? Does he give the land that he conquered? He led the Israelites. He conquered the land. He is about to distribute it among the people. Does does he just give it to his own immediate family like most ruling kings in the ancient Near East would have done? Does he keep it just to himself? No. He distributes his accomplishments. He distributes his resources according to God's word. He knows in the depth of his soul, the land that he has been given is God's to be distributed according to God's word, not to be a resource that is to be hoarded for himself. What does this teach us about our resources that we're managing during COVID-19? Yes, we should make sure we have enough food and water and toilet paper and necessities, but isn't this also a time in which we can put on display the overabundant generosity of God towards the things of God that he desires and he cares about? As a church, we are going to be thinking very hard and praying specifically about how our resources can be strategically maximized during this season of COVID-19 to display the bold and courageous leadership that God displays, like, like through Joshua, in an o- with overabundant generosity. I hope you love giving to this church because we love giving the resources of this church away to those who need it most. 
Yet in the midst of this description of Joshua giving away the land to half-tribe of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, there's also a warning. Still, they still had work to do. They, they still had peoples among them like the Maccathites and the Geshurites in verse 13 that was still a call towards courageous and bold leadership even after Joshua was gone. Then in verses 15 through 13, Joshua begins by distributing the, south, uh, the land in the south in the east of the Jordan, to the tribe of Reuben. This description of the land comes also with a warning in verse 22. Those who, who formerly occupied this land, they, they practiced divination. Balaam was a, a false prophet who met a swift and decisive death because he took bribes from the kings of Midianites that tried to curse Israel. But our God, he cannot be bribed. Our God uh, cannot be manipulated by a false prophet. And he was met with a swift destruction of the sword. This warning, as they were kind of finishing the task, is put in the text to let the Israelites know that the supernatural only comes from Yahweh himself, and God cannot be bought with resources. He can only be displayed through giving of the resources to those who need it and those whom he calls to be given to North of Reuben's inheritance is the inheritance of Gad. It stretched uh, from, through the central region of the land uh, just east of the Jordan along uh, nearly the entire length of the Jordan River. Just north of that was the, uh, the border to the northern border was the half-tribe of Manasseh, and it was given only to half of the tribe's inheritance, so it was given to the clan of Machir and that. And then in verse 32, it summarizes all of the, the, the the land east of the Jordan that was distributed to these two and a half tribes that was given, just as Moses had said, in the plains of Moab. Joshua was ensuring that even though his life, he was coming to the end of his life, he was still following through on everything that the Lord had commanded him to do. He knew that God had been abundantly gracious and he had no problem of letting go of the resources entrusted to him in order for those resources to be distributed to God's people according to God's word. When Andrea and I were uh, seeking God and just trying to discern where God would be leading us in the next phase of our life and our ministry, we had a clear conviction that he was leading, to a, leading us to a church like Sierra Bible Church. We didn't know Sierra Bible Church in particular, but, but we had a clear conviction of the, the type of church that he was leading us towards. While we didn't hear an audible voice and we didn't hear a message, we didn't see a message written in the sky, we, we were convinced in the depths of our soul that this was the type of church that he was leading us to be a part of. We didn't know the specific details, but we had a conviction of calling. When the details became apparent, when we met with the people of Sierra Bible Church, when we visited Reno for the very first time, when we began to unpack the history of the church and the direction that the church desired to go, we knew that this was the exact people that God was calling us to. Now, 15 years previous to that, I gave up skiing. I had this ambition in high school and the early parts of college to, to live my vocation as an outdoor lifestyle, to be like a backcountry skier and a mountaineer by profession, and the, to live that out. Yet after my first year in Colorado, after my first year of college, I gave it up, and not without, without a second thought. The very fact that God would call me to serve in the largest city closest to Lake Tahoe one of the most beautiful mountainous regions on the planet, it was God's added bonus to me. It was something I didn't presume to have ever experienced the, the blessing of enjoying this side of heaven ever again. I, I truly had given it up. And so when it was clear that, that God was calling us to Sierra Bible Church in Reno, Nevada, it literally brought me to tears. And on multiple occasions, it still does even to this day. He really is that good to me. He really does desire to give me far abundantly more than anything that I could ever ask or even imagine. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are in Christ, God is always giving us far abundantly more than anything that we could ever ask or imagine. Even when things are taken away by God for a season, even when things are taken away by God, even for a lifetime. God is preparing 
an overabundance of grace to be poured out on all of his children for all of eternity, whether we receive it here in this age or in the age that is to come eternally in Christ. The question for every believer shouldn't be, is God going to be gracious to me? If you're in Christ, the answer to that question is, yes, absolutely, he is going to be gracious to you. The question that is pressing for us today as believers in Christ is, how are we going to use the resources that he has entrusted to us to display that grace that we have already received in abundance? Or how are we going to steward the grace that we have already received right now and best display it to those who need to see it most clearly? The only way that you can do this, the only way that I can do this, through a season of loss and recession and through things being taken away, is if we answer yes in the depth of our soul to the final question that this text implies. Is God enough? If you notice, there was a tribe that's mentioned in the text that I haven't talked about yet. In verse 14 and in verse 33, the, the text mentions the tribe of Levi. Every tribe in Israel was given an inheritance in the promised land. The importance of land in the ancient Near East, it really can't be overstated. Land meant economic vibrancy. Land meant a means of livelihood. Land meant a place of safety and security. Land meant a national identity as a people. The ideal life for those who were living in the ancient Near East was living in rest in a land that was their possession. For the Israelites, possession of the land of meant freedom and salvation from their oppressors. But Levi is the forerunner of the New Testament Christian. Levi was not at home in the land. Levi was not even saved by possession of the land, of the land whatsoever. Verse 14, it says this, To the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by fire to the Lord, the God of Israel, are their inheritance, as he said to them. Levi's source of livelihood, sustenance, and economic security was only God himself. He was the forerunner of what it looked like to live by faith in God who would provide a future land, a future inheritance, and a future kingdom. His security was not tied to possession of a specific earthly land. And then verse 33 closes out the chapter with this particular point. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel himself is their inheritance. The question that the existence of the tribe of Levi under the Old Covenant should challenge New Testament Christians with today, and it's good for us to think about, and it is haunting for us to live out, is this. If God takes everything away, if God removes everything from us so that we have nothing left other than God, is that enough? Is that enough? Andrea and I have some friends with a deep conviction that uh, we're preparing to live overseas uh, among a people that they felt called to live among, that have very little access to the gospel. As they were preparing to go, they were literally selling all of their possessions, their cars, their musical instruments, their, their furniture, everything that they owned was being put up for sale so that they could go and live among a people whom they believed God was calling them to serve. Before they left, they produced a, an entire album of songs that, that fueled their journey for, for them to go from where they were at to the place where they believed God was leading them. One song they, they titled, Bare White Walls, and it captures this impulse that, that we should have, that all believers of, in Christ should have perfectly. It begins like this. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nobody. There is nobody. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nobody. There is nobody. If heaven's just a room with bare white walls, and you and me, that's all I'll ever need. Amen.